So, as has been said, we're in the book of Peter, and um, last week Chris handled the first couple of verses, and I'm not going to repeat it. He was masterfully did it, some really tricky things there. I was just smiling to myself, thinking Peter says later on the book that, you know, Paul writes about things that we, we, it's hard to understand, but Peter certainly has some there as well. So, but well done, Chris, it was amazing. But I am going to start reading there again, just to put everybody in the picture. Maybe you went here or forgotten. So I'm going to start at verse 1. But before I do, it is up to verse 12 is my passage, but um, just the title. The title for, this, for today, what I've put there, if you want one, is A Call to a Personal Doxology. Now, you may think, what is that? Um, well, I trust it will become clear as I preach, and so A Call to a Personal do- Doxology, that's the title. Okay, let's go. So, verse 1, 1 Peter 1. It says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, Exiles scattered throughout the province of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, or the Spirit, to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Did you pick up the Trinity there? Beautiful, isn't it? Grace and peace, the twin blessings of the New Testament, be yours in abundance. Then there's verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who, through faith, are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him, and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets, who spoke of the grace that was to come to you, searched intently and with greatest care, with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing, when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. Amazing. So last week Chris um, introduced us into this new series and um, this is the letter of the Apostle Paul to the church and it identifies uh, sorry, Peter. Peter. Thanks, my love. So it's Peter, and he, and he immediately sets the scene there that it is for us. We, each and every one of us, scattered throughout all those provinces, immediately puts us into the picture that the Trinity, the whole Trinity, is involved in our salvation, in the whole fulfillment of the gospel. And he's going to expound further on, those, on the three persons of the Trinity, which is why I wanted to introduce that, because you'll see that coming through. Now, what we may not... Um, sort of keep in mind, or may forget, is the fact that this is now 30 years or so after Jesus had ascended into heaven. So the church has been going for 30 years. It's still fairly young, as it were, but actually the church has, has grown. And the church has, has um, suffered tremendous persecution, and there's actually a greater persecution coming. So there's been trials that they've been used to, but more is coming. And Peter anticipates this, and he's writing this letter. But Peter is no longer the Peter of the gospel. We tend to, to put him in the gospels that we've read, the Peter that put his foot in things, you know, speaks before he, can, he really thinks, that kind of Peter. It's not him. This is the Peter that has been anointed by God. The Peter whose revelation of Christ being the Messiah became the cornerstone, that revelation on which the church is built. So this is a significant individual. He has become... The, he, he is the most prominent apostle. He's the one who is the anchor of the church that has been built. And so when we read this, it is not just a letter from some person to some others. 
This is a significant person who's written it. He is anointed by God and to lead his people. Remember when he was restored, God said to him to take care of his flock, to lead his flock, and to watch over them. And so um, this anointing rests on him. So when you read this, every single word is measured. This is actually quite amazing. And everything, I mean, I can preach hours on just this passage that I've got, because you can expound on each and every one of these words so much. So there is such depth here, there is such wisdom, and it is loaded with theology, everything of it. So even now, as we see what Peter does, he's introduced this, he's pronounced the blessing of God over them, and then he jumps in and he starts with a song of praise. He actually starts with a song, which is the scholars call the doxology of the New Testament. So what is this thing of the doxology that I've spoken about? Well, the doxology is, is, is um, quite simply a, um, praise and glory. That's what it means. Doxology is praise and glory. But in Christian circles, it refers to the liturgical formula of praise to God or a pattern for worship used to praise God on a regular basis. So there's a classic hymn that we all know or may, may know if you've been in church for quite some time called the doxology. And its uh, lyrics is, Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So Peter, I believe, his intention with this message is to actually stir each and every single one of us to develop our own doxology. Whether you wake up in the morning and your doxology is this little song that I've introduced you to, Lord, I thank you for sunshine, I thank you for rain. I thank you for joy and I thank you for pain. It's a beautiful day. Sometimes life is good, but then a trouble comes my way. But whatever happens, Lord, I thank you for this day. And when I'm feeling troubled, I lift my hands and pray that your will be done in the rain or sun. Oh, it's a beautiful day. I don't want to act too high and mighty, because tomorrow I may fall down on my face. Good theology, just stay humble. Lord, I thank you for sunshine. I thank you for rain. I thank you for joy. I thank you for pain. It's a beautiful day. I give thanks when I'm feeling lonely. I give thanks when I'm feeling glad. I give thanks in the morning and thanks in the evening. I give thanks when I'm feeling sad. Lord, I thank you for sunshine. I thank you for rain. I thank you for joy. I thank you for pain. It's a beautiful day. I was just thinking that song that Mikey was reciting is also quite incredible. So there are many, many of these things. So whether you do that or whether you get into the habit of reciting scripture, like Psalm 100, it's an amazing one to start your day with. It says, Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful song. Know that the Lord is... Uh, no, sorry. For the, um, uh, you are... It is you who made us and we are yours. We are the, um, your people, the sheep of your pastor. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Worship him or sing praise to him. Thank him for the Lord is good. His love endures forever. His faithfulness through all generations. Those things become part of your heart, of your life, and you just, it just bubbles over. The moment you, you wake up and you have breath in your lungs again, you can open your eyes to a new beautiful day, no matter what the circumstances. I believe that is what is on Peter's heart. That is his intention. And I believe it is because as you go through this book, you'll see that Peter wants us to be assured of our salvation. He wants us to have such confidence in our eternal inheritance that it would bubble over in a joy that is contagious, a hope that is contagious and fictitious, so that people around you will be impacted by that, and the gospel would spread, and the kingdom would come wherever you go. That's Peter's intention. Chris called it splendor through fire. It's an amazing summary. You can, that God produces in us when we really know him. So develop your doxology. Now, this song of Peter, as I said, it's actually a masterful, masterfully written song. Of course, it's been inspired by the Holy Spirit, but I just marvel at, at the Word of God. Not a single word is wasted. It is like there's so much more. Sometimes I wish they could actually add in more to just make things a bit clearer. But it is there, and that's what the Holy Spirit has given for us to, to help us explore those things, uncover them. That is the beauty of walking with God. So in this um, 
Peter then not only sort of uh, um, introduces or sings uh, this song to people, but he actually shows us the reasons why we can have a song of praise in our hearts towards God the Father, towards Jesus, and towards the Holy Spirit. It's like a division of that. But as I go through that, don't get caught up in the thing, well, did God do this, the Father or the, the Son? Or that? That's not what it's about. What P Peter is actually saying and introducing is, is that we're aware of, of all three persons of the Trinity all the time and that we actually see their beautiful interwovenness in all of our lives, of everything that, that is involved with us. And he wants us to, to have an equal relationship with each of them, expressing that joy on a constant basis and that thanksgiving and praise. But at the same time as him doing this, which the portions you'll see as we go through, he also introduces the three main themes of this book, which would be later on further explored and taught. So it's just beautiful the way he's done it. He introduces the idea that we identify with the family of God, the whole thing of suffering as a witness for Jesus, and then later on the future hope, which he will explain in um, more detail as we go on, which I'm not going to get into today. So let's see. Verse 3 then. It says, Praise be, or the NIV, the ESV said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now that phrase, praise be or blessed be, is actually the word, Greek word is eulogy. So we're all familiar with the eulogy if we've attended memorials. But it is not only intended for memorials. The word eulogy means to speak well of someone. So what that implies is that there has to be a relationship. For you choose a person who knows you the best, or who's known the person that's died the best to bring a eulogy. So it is to speak well of somebody implies that we need a relationship with them. So the first thing here that we see that, that um, is implied then is that we have this beautiful opportunity of relationship with God. I don't know what all is happening here. <laughs> so that relationship with God is being made possible because of Jesus. Of God, with God the Father. So the first reason Paul says, oh, Peter says here that we can actually praise the Father for is for giving us the Son. Because it is the Son that has come, Jesus said of himself to um, Philip in John 49, that if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So he was sent to reveal the Father to us, to introduce us to the Father, to teach us who the, about the Father, to be an example, but also something of, of the Father. He says that no one knows the Son except the Father. No one knows the Father except the Son or those whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. So it is Jesus that reveals the Father to us. It's that interplay is so beautiful. So the first reason, praise the Father for the Son, for giving us the Son. Then he says, In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope and an inheritance. So first of all, in His great mercy... So the second reason, then, why we can praise the Father is for His great mercy. Because it is not, what mercy means is to not get what you deserve. So we deserve the wrath of God. We deserve punishment. We deserve to be expelled from His presence. We don't deserve anything good. But because of God's great mercy, or according to His great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. So thank God for his mercy. Romans um, 9 verse 16 says, speaking about um, God's sovereign choice of us, it says, it's, um, it's which is God's choosing of you, does not therefore depend on man's desire or effort, but on God's mercy. So we praise God for his mercy. Because through his mercy, we have been caused to be born again, or to begin a new birth. And that means, and that word is a new genesis. So genesis is a complete new beginning. There's something so incredible. You know when you've messed up, or somebody has, and their life is really in a mess, they, they all have this desire, I wish I could just start again. I wish I could just have a clean slate, and start all over, and have, a new, uh, have another go. That is wonderful. But being born again is may more than that. Because if you and yourself just move to another place or whatever and you start again, you still have that same nature. That nature that's actually unable to pursue God. A nature that actually is enslaved by sin, enslaved to sin. You actually don't have the ability to say no to sin. 
But being born again means you, you <clears throat> have been given a new nature. It's not a perfect nature that never will sin again. That's not what it means. But it is a nature that can say yes to God and can say no to sin. And that is what is so glorious about it. All because of God's great mercy. Everything has been made new. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, If anyone is in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Praise God the Father for his great mercy. Amazing. Then goes on to say that through that we have been given new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. So the next reason we can praise the Father is for the resurrection of Jesus. When I get to Jesus, you see, we can also praise him for the resurrection. But first of all, look at the aspect from the Father, that the Father raised Jesus back to life. He was involved there. And we can praise him for it because it is through the resurrection that we can participate in resurrection. If Jesus wasn't raised, we couldn't have been raised. If Jesus wasn't raised, we would never have victory over sin and death. So the resurrection is significant. Going to the cross means a lot. But if there was no resurrection, you know that song, Friday is good because Sunday is coming. That's true. <laughs> That's why it's the resurrection. You celebrate the resurrection and you praise the Father for the resurrection because the resurrection proves that Jesus accomplished his mission. He was successful in fulfilling that which God the Father had sent him to do, which is to come and live a perfect life, to be able to be the perfect sacrifice so, on, so that he could pay the penalty of our sin on our behalf. So praise Father for the resurrection. It is the resurrection that proves that God forgave G, uh, or accepted Jesus' sacrifice to forgive our sin. And it's the resurrection that secured for us a living hope. Now this hope is living because it is based on the resurrection of Christ. It means that Jesus is never going to die again, so the hope is, is not something that is temporal. It's not got a, a time frame to it that it's going to stop. It is going to continue for, forever. That's living. And the hope, when we think of it from an English use of the word, it is um, the sort of meaning is it is some, something I am optimistic about, but I'm not absolutely certain of. That is not the biblical hope. In biblical terms, hope is something that I am absolutely sure of and have an absolute confident expectation of. So whenever you see hope in the New Testament, it is a sure foundation. It's not something that you have just have got optimism about but I'm not sure. It's a sure foundation. So, through the resurrection, we've been secured an eternal well-being. Praise the Father. Now, the characteristics of this inheritance is also important to note here. Um, as I said, there's <laughs> so much. It's not just a simple thing that is loaded with it. So, what we learn from the characteristics of this inheritance is, first of all, it belongs to us. God, Jesus is secured for us. Not for the angels, not for others, but for you and me. Each one of us has got an eternal inheritance. Next, which is incredible, is that it is, the um, characteristics is that it would never perish, spoil, or fade. The ESV says, imperishable, undefiled, unfading. Clear. So it is not like some earthly trophy that you get. I was thinking of a of these trophies that people get when they win a great competition or something like that. It is all amazing. They've poured out their lives for it and so much time, and there is the trophy. And it gets put on the mantelpiece or wherever and gets admired for some time. But when, by the time the next generation comes, the trophy is probably tarnished. It's been polished way too many times now, so you're getting bored of it. And eventually it actually ends up in an attic and the next generation probably on a rubbish dump somewhere. That's, it's not like that. He says, this, this reward, this inheritance that God would give us will never lose its value, will never lose its significance, will never lose its attraction. It will be for all eternity to be enjoyed and admired and reveled in. That is the inheritance God has for us. 
Then it says that it is kept for you. Kept in heaven for you. So it is not like you pour yourself out, imagine the run, a race, and then just at the last moment somebody else pips you to the finish line and then you've lost it. It's not like that. It's not like Jehovah's Witnesses that believe that only 144,000 can be saved so they could die having made it in. Then 100 years later, somebody else lives who's more righteous than them and then they lose their space in heaven. It's not like that. Ours is a sure foundation. It is absolutely um, secured for us, kept in heaven for us. No one else can take it. It is ours. And what is more, it is not just that we are kept for it, I mean that, that it is kept for us. We are being kept for it. That is so beautiful. That's the fourth reason that we can praise the Father, because it carries on to say that this inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power. ESV says guarded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. So we do not put our confidence on our ability to keep ourselves to the very end. We put it on the power of God that would keep us to the very end. Peter wants us to have an absolute assurance of our salvation and the fact that we can be kept to the very end. But there is a but. There is a possibility that your faith may fail. Because that's the, what, what is here. But what is that? So I need to just explain. In Luke 8, verse 13, Luke 8, Jesus tells a parable of the sower. And the story of the seed landing on different parts, and a part of it that lands amongst the rocks. It says that those are the people who receive the message with joy, but when the testing and the trial comes, they fall away. So that implies that the faith can be stolen can actually fall away. Peter was addressed by Jesus. And Jesus said to him that Satan asked to sift you like wheat. But I prayed for you that your faith will not fail. So even Peter's faith had the opportunity to fail. Which makes us quite serious. But friends, it is a faith that is not, uh, not the faith that God has given us, not earthed in what he um, achieves for us. Because I'll show you now, You'll, it will come clearer now. But it says in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23, it says, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body, so that's the totality of who you are, be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Philippians, we saw... Jesus said, he who began a good work will bring it to completion. It is there. But the question mark is, is your faith a real faith? That's where the question lies. Once it is real faith, it is established that God will keep it. We put our absolute confidence in that. But this text does tell us that you have to test your faith. You actually do not, should not balk all tests and trials. Because God brings it to us to prove to ourselves whether our faith is real. And we'll get to it just now. We know that, um, sorry, let me just hold, leave it there. Verse 6, it says, so from the 6 to 9, just broadly, we see actually now the reasons why we can have a song of praise in our heart for the second person of the Trinity, which is Jesus. His contribution to all this. So verse 6 says, In all this you greatly rejoice, that now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes, perishes even though refined by fire, may result, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Okay. 
So the first reason that is here, that is implied and comes actually from before already, is we praise Jesus also for the resurrection, his part in it. We praise him for actually in humility submitting to the will of the Father, as we've seen from Philippians 2, verse 6 and 9. The whole thing of Jesus giving himself over to the way that the Father has put there for him to be the redemptive um, force for us, the one who would redeem us from our sins. So we praise Jesus for doing that. We have a song in our heart of praise and exaltation and glory to him for living that perfect life that was required to be the perfect sacrifice, which would, through his resurrection, entail, then gain all these things for us. So reason one is we praise Jesus for being the one who was raised. Secondly, we praise Jesus as we seek in this part for being the one who actually helps us to sustain our faith through the trial and testing. Because it says he is the one on whom we can fix our eyes in the midst of the trial. He is the one who is the anchor of our faith and the source of our hope. He is the one whom we have got the opportunity of, who God sent, who walked the earth, who is the one to which most easily we can attach our faith because he actually had human flesh. God the Father can always remain a little bit distant and the Holy Spirit's a little bit mystical, but the Son is the one that can anchor our faith, the one that we fix our eyes upon. So we thank him for being that so that the trial can actually have its, its impact, that we do not bail from it, but we actually gain what it should, which is the salvation of our souls and the proving of, of the... Um, truthfulness of our faith, our faith that is in the realness of it, a faith that will then not fail. So, just with regards to these trials also, there's some characteristics of a trial, a Christian trial that we go through that also comes from this text that I just want to highlight because I think it's important. And it is, first of all, we see that it says there that it is for a little while. So every trial, every testing that comes our way comes with an expiry date. And can't, aren't we grateful for that? And it is a little while. So for most of it, it is actually the shortest period of time. But even if it is for your whole life, be it 100 years, what is 100 years in the context of time that has no end? If you enter eternity, as it were, and it's a, you've lived 100 years. For the first 100 years, it's like equal. But by the 100,000th year, this 100 years is actually totally insignificant. It's like a little while. And that's what it is, it is saying. It will not continue into eternity. And even on earth, it, most times it is short. But even if it is long, it is a little while. So every trial comes with an expiry date. Praise God. And it says to make us aware that there are various trials. It's all kinds. Some, various, some translations, that word even means multicolored. So it can take on all forms, so many things. For example, it could be in a form of, of physical sickness. It can be in a form of a disability. It can be in a form of, of uh, just a loss of some kind, loss of loved ones, loss of jobs, loss of finances, loss of relational uh, wholeness, there's so many things that the trials always can come. But in that all, you can fix your eyes on Jesus and the trial will have its desired impact. Third aspect or characteristic of trials is that they are never random. They're not just so happened. Each and every one of them, whether God allows it or actually explicitly causes it, is with a purpose. It is with intentionality from God. Because you see, friends, we do not understand the weight of actually our lives in the per context of eternity. We build on eternity net, but how you live here impacts eternity. And what God develops within you here impacts your eternal experience. And God is more committed to our eternal well-being than we ourselves are. So he will put you through challenges that you think this is the end, that you, that you cannot actually bear. But it's a loving God who does it because he has the fruit, the end result in mind, which would be expounded on for all eternity. So don't you want to rather like, 
Uh, George says, crawl into heaven, but no, you know, with the ex- <laughs> like, pour yourself out, but have this glorious future. Then go there all shiny and beautiful, but actually it's so little in the context of eternity. So every trial comes with a purpose and an intent from a loving God because he wants to prove to you, that's the big point that I need to also, whether your faith is real or not, because he calls us to do that, to challenge that. If you look at the book of, uh, the letter of Apostle John to the the church, 1 John, if you read through that, there are five questions there that, uh, that John says, ask yourselves these questions to see whether you are in the faith. It is throughout that, this thing of building your house upon the rock or on the sand. Jesus tells that parable. And he says, the one that's built on the sand, when the storms come, will, will, the, the, will crash down. And then sometimes they say, this, the fall will be spectacular. He doesn't want us to have that. He wants us to be based firmly. So test your faith. That is what he's talking about. So we can praise and, and um, Jesus for the fact that he's the one that would help us through the trial so it will have its desired effect of proving our faith to be real. Verse 10. It says, Concerning the salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you, when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit from heaven. Sorry, sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. So this portion describes why we can praise the Holy Spirit. And it is because the Holy Spirit is the one who actually allows us or works within us to understand the fullness of salvation. That's what this is all about. It says that the prophets in the Old Testament, the things that they prophesied and declared, was all there to aid towards this salvation that's going to happen. Jesus that would come, everything around that, it is to the completion of salvation. But they themselves never could quite grasp the full breadth of it and get a full understanding of it. But through the Holy Spirit, you and I have the privilege of not only understanding it, but actually experiencing the fullness of salvation. So to explain it a bit more, consider for a moment that salvation is like a manufacturing plant. Okay, so let's say it's a manufacturing of vehicles, cars. So what about a Ferrari, okay? So imagine a Ferrari is being assembled in this factory. Ferrari symbolizing salvation. Peter is saying is that the prophets, uh, each of them, are like one of the people in that assembly line of the Ferrari. So say, for instance, Jeremiah was the one who put together the carburetor. So he would receive all the different little parts of the carburetor, the springs, nuts, bolts, whatever, valves, things that are in there, puts it together. He knows that this is a very important part in the function of the end result, okay? But he does not have the privilege to ever see the end result. He only sits at his desk, does his job, receive the one, pass it on to the next. That's what he's saying. He never had the joy of seeing the final product, knowing how it works, knowing how it performs, and even knowing exactly what his part made that incredible performance of the vehicle. But he knows it's of significance, so he does his job with diligence. But you and I, friends... Through the Holy Spirit. Do not only admire the Ferrari through the glass window of the showroom. You get to drive it out the showroom. (laughs) Put it through its bases. You get to own it. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. He gives you the opportunity to fully understand what it means to be justified. Justified. Just as if I've never sinned. 
to live in the confidence of that. Just as if I've perfectly kept the law and received all the benefits of perfection in the sight of God. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And we can praise Him for that. We can wake up every morning with a song of praise in our heart. A doxology to Jesus, the Son, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit <coughs> enables you to experience sanctification. To be made holy. How incredible is that? And you can experience it. Paul says to be moved from glory to glory. We can taste it. We can see it in our own lives. People can experience it in us as we are being made holy. And one day, we're going to experience, because of the work of the Holy Spirit, the glory of inheriting our glorified bodies. That is beautiful. That, for that, we can praise the Holy Spirit. Sorry. So, the Holy Spirit, friends, I think it's one that we can pay so much more attention to. He is the one who inspired the prophets. He is the one who knows the revelation behind every mystery in Scripture. He is the one who knows all the nuances, who understands the heart of the Father. What is behind a commandment is not just there or is a face value, but there's a purpose. There's something the Holy Spirit can explain it to you. He can make you understand it, make you see the beauty of it. He is the one who, who has the wisdom of the Son. Jesus, being wisdom personified, he is the one who is our perfect counselor. He's the one who is committed to us. Never leave us nor forsake us. Hebrews 11, I mean 13, 5 says. He is the one, one through whom we can experience the fullness of salvation. And he has promised to every single one. John 7, verse 38, 39 says that whoever believes in he, that is Jesus, as scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. So friend, my question to you today is, is your faith a real faith? Is your faith a faith that would stand the test of trials and testing? Because if it is, you can have absolute assurance of it, that God will keep you. It's not based on your own ability to keep you. God will keep you, but is your faith real? And Charles Spurgeon says that the test for whether faith is real is to ask yourself, ask people around you, does your life testify to the fact that you are being led by the Holy Spirit? Are you being led by the Holy Spirit? In other words, do you have the Holy Spirit? Is he transforming you? And are you being led by him? So friends, if that is not your testimony, it can change. It can change here today. All you have to do is to ask him. And the reason why it may not be your, test your testimony is, first of all, because you may have never come to the realization that you actually need a savior. Maybe here and you've been enjoying this there's the fellowship of saints and been in the community, but you've never actually been confronted with the fact, is my faith a real, fact, a, a real faith? You've never actually come to the place of realizing that you need to surrender to God, that you actually need a Savior. The second reason is that it could happen is that you thought that you were there, but you were actually deceived. You can say, God's told me this, God's told me that, but actually is it real? What is the track record of it? Can others testify to the fact that your life bears testimony to being led by the Holy Spirit? And so, the opportunity is there for us to respond and to ask Him, and He would make it real. So just as you are sitting, I want to pray a prayer. And if you identify with that, if during this time you thought, Suddenly things have raised within me, within my heart. It's jumping, you know, it's there. I'm not sure. Maybe it is because God is allowing you this beautiful opportunity today to make sure. Because remember, Peter's intention with this letter 
is that you should have an absolute assurance of salvation that can never waver, never be, be um, you know, on shaky grounds, totally convinced that you belong to him, knowing with absolute assurance that your, your um, eternal inheritance is secure in him. That's his desire. So don't leave here wondering. Respond. I'm going to pray a prayer, and I'd like you to simply repeat it within your own heart. But be serious with God. And prove that sincerity by, by just helping yourself. Because the devil is going to, going to try and take that seed away again, like the seed that was sown. So to do it, you need to share it with someone else. And I'd love for you to share it with me, because I'd love to follow up with you. So you can find my telephone number. It's on the lists in the, of the life groups or whatever. Just send me a message and say, I, I want you to make sure, and I prayed that prayer today. And I'd like to follow up with you. So, if that is you, just as you are, let's just pray together. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this incredible day. I thank you that every morning we can wake up with a song of praise. And I want to ask you today, Lord, that I would be able to wake up every morning with absolute assurance and confidence that my life is secure in you that my eternal inheritance is secure because I belong to you. So I ask you now, please forgive my sins. Please forgive my rebellion. Forgive my ignorance and make me your own. Please make your son Jesus the leader of my life. Please be my savior. And please fill me with your Holy Spirit that I may experience the leading of your Holy Spirit and the transformation that will take place as you change me from glory to glory, that I can understand the fullness of salvation. I ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Won't you stand, please? So I asked for, we're going to be doing communion this now, but I'd ask for them to just, just finish this part of the meeting with this response song. And it's a song that incorporates that doxology. And I want to encourage you or, or sort of what's it, provoke you or into it to develop your own doxology. The formula of praise that you have. When I was doing the Easy Yoke series, I spoke about this Thanksgiving ritual that you have in the morning. This is a similar thing. Develop a habit within that when you wake up, let the word of God just bubble from within out in praise and glory to God. Memorize a psalm or a song and stir that within you. It's a whole new way to live and it is so beautiful. So let's just enjoy this praise to God.